Look, this is uh, for intro to music uh, 110 and the fall one class and the dual enrollment class. Uh, first, I want to give an explanation as to why this lesson has been long and being posted. Uh, I had my computer to crash last week and a lot of my materials on the hard drive. So I had to send it into the shop and the guy that's working on it has taken uh, longer than I expected. He's had some trouble, he had to replace some other board. The hard drive's okay, my information's okay. I just haven't been able to access it. Uh, this is lesson six this week. And while we're talking, I just wanted to point out a couple of things that we've only got a couple more weeks. And so a lot of your written work is due. Some of the, your tests, uh, some, well, I shouldn't say that, with some have not turned in all their tests. But here's the deal. Uh, your two listening assignments, you can turn them in any time uh, up to the last day of class, which, uh, pardon me, I think it's the 15th or 11th, but don't quote me on that. Um, your five-page research paper, I would like for you to turn that in next week by around the 6th. Uh, that gives me time plenty of time to read it and to grade it. The performance essays, they're easy to deal with, uh, and I can grade those quickly. We're going to do this lesson six and probably lesson seven, covering just the introduction to the history of Western music. So uh, that's what you're going to be seeing today. Now, I would ask you uh, to open your PowerPoint that is with this. And by the way, I'll put a PowerPoint and this video link and a test onto Blackboard. So when you open up this link, you'll be watching this. Open up the PowerPoint and follow along because there's several things that we want to cover. So let me get started. Uh, in your PowerPoint, you'll open it up to see the Middle Ages and down below that it's going to say Medieval Age, give you the dates of 450 to 1450. What we're looking at is the beginning of what we officially consider Western civilization and music. The civilization that we're dealing with starts roughly at 450, and that date coincides with the fall of Rome. And if you go to slide two, you see a pretty picture. Then go to slide three, you see an image of the Roman Empire. And if I apologize if I'm looking down, but I, I've got this open on my uh, wife's laptop in my lap so I can look at hers, but I don't have a, all my information on it. Uh, but at any rate, this is just an image of the Roman Empire to give you an idea of what we're looking at. Rome was the unifying agent for Western civilization as it spread the Roman culture throughout Europe or most of Europe and even into Britain. The key component about the Rome and why we look to Rome is that Rome built some good roads and they set up garrison outposts throughout their empire and this allowed for travel and trade. Uh, they had the Greek language and they also spoke Latin. The Latin would denigrate into the church but there was still Greek being spoken all the way into the Scandinavian countries uh, for trade purposes and so with that going on more people are communicating. Now uh, the next slide, uh, I think it's slide four, I'll just give you a, an image of a model of the city of Rome to let you know that we're dealing with uh, a pretty well advanced engineering culture. Rome, I know this isn't a study on Rome, but you need to understand Rome so you can understand Western civilization. In that, you see things like the Circus Maximus down on the left, the Colosseum to the right, a Roman aqueduct, and then in the center of it is the Forum. Rome built a lot everywhere they went. They built buildings and they built um, temples, they built aqueducts, and more importantly, they built roads. Uh, but within that one picture, you see the glory and the, 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 I guess you'd say, the reason Rome fell. They were a glorified military system until they became an, imp an empire and the military began to weaken as people began to enjoy themselves more. You had the Circus Maximus, which was their version of NASCAR, and then right 
a few blocks away, you have the Colosseum, and we, we know what that's famous for. But along with that, Rome had such amenities as running water. Uh, they had inside toilets and baths uh, where they would literally able to flush things. The problem was they flushed it into the street, uh, and there was a narrow trench, and that eventually led to disease. That disease led to the plague in the Greek quarter, and that eventually led to Nero deciding he wanted to rebuild Rome, and we know the story of how he burnt Rome, but that's why he built it, uh, to sort of clean it up uh, or rebuild it. He actually burned it first, and then he tried to rebuild it, but Rome was quite an amazing culture. Now, the next slide, if it will advance. Uh, okay, I'm just not having much luck with computers these days. You see a image of Roman legions, and this is what you would call basically a cohort, like our platoon. These are reenactors, but they're, they're interesting because they give you a good example of what made Rome great, and it was its military power. They used advanced technology wherever they could, uh, and not to bore you with it, but I did want to point a couple of things out. Rome, for instance, you're looking at uh, you know the commander and the soldiers. They... The guy on the right, who is the commander of this group, you'll notice his shins. He wears what's known as greaves, metal protectors on his shin. You'll notice these guys had metal armor, and most of it covers the front of their body. The common soldier would have leather on his back and sometimes greaves on his shin, but nothing on the back of his leg. And the logic there was, if most of your armor is facing the enemy, you don't want to turn around and run away from them. So that encouraged the soldiers not to run away in battle. Uh, they used a large shield, and they had a, a javelin, you see there, which is an amazing piece of technology because it's not like a spear. A spear is just a long stick with a tip, and you throw it at the enemy. They came up with the idea of making the metal tip longer so the spear was actually lighter. You could throw it further, and then they put uh, sort of a pyramid-shaped tip on it that if it goes into the enemy... If you try to pull it out, you basically pull a lot of their insides out. Also, if it pierced a shield, then the enemy couldn't take it out of their shield. The Romans could use it to jerk the shield away from them. Uh, like I said, everything was designed for close quarter warfare. They didn't use a broad sword. They used about an 18-inch short sword, which was good for jabbing. Uh, the next slide, you see another one. These are a couple of scenes from movies and, like I said, from reenactors. But notice in the right-hand corner, they use their shields to create what's known as a turtle. And that was used to march into the enemy. And you would usually see spears coming out all around from the guys in the, the row on the edge. And then the guys behind them would reach through and stab them with their swords or their spears. Uh, what it does show here is another little innovation in warfare. And that was they had hooked cleats on their feet. And it was like attaching metal cleats onto their sandals so that when they went forward, uh, a lot of warfare was pushing and shoving. They could lock themselves into the ground and not get pushed. And also, when you have a turtle and you're stabbing people, knocking them down, as you walked over them, you could rake and claw them to death with the cleats on your shoes. So everything was very efficient. This allowed Rome to conquer and to spread. Now, the next slide, slide seven, uh, it's just a famous painting of the gladiatorial games. And some say this is the beginning of the demise. Uh, the Colosseum wasn't built till 61 AD. And the games were usually professional soldiers going in, showing with the prize. It wasn't about killing your enemy. It was about showing how good you were. Sometimes people get hurt. Sometimes they get killed. Uh, they would hold public executions in the morning. And then they would have slaves fighting to the death and then the evening they would bring in professionals and they would put on a show and it was sort of akin to you know wrestling where you see all these really good athletes doing incredible moves but they're not really trying to kill anybody that later sort of evolved down into the brutality where they had more and more trained slaves and that's what we think of as gladiators as trained slaves who were professional killers. Uh, it hurt them because it led to revolts from, from these guys, and we're famously uh, thinking of Spartacus. Uh, but anyway, there became this bloodlust blood in Rome, and, 
uh, people were more interested in entertainment than in accomplishments. Uh, that led to the demise of Rome. Slide eight, you see what is left of the Forum today, and that's in the city of Rome. The, you get a good glimpse of the Forum, though, and you get a scale of what was going on, because if you look very carefully uh, along that road going in the middle, those are people. So you compare the size of those people to the size of those columns, and you realize these were magnificent buildings that they built. Uh, now, I talk about the division of Rome on slide nine because I want you to realize that Rome itself began to slip into demise. In the east, there was a city called Byzantium, which would later be called Constantinople after Constantine. And that was the most wealthy of the two cities. You had Western Empire in, located in Rome, you had the Eastern Empire located in Byzantium or Constantinople, they were right on the trade route. So they got very rich. They fought wars with everybody, including Rome. Uh, and eventually they became more powerful of the two. Uh, around three, I don't know if I wrote it down, 306, uh, Constantine, who was a actually a Greek who became Rome, uh, he took over, won a major battle, and declared Christianity was the state religion. Now, doesn't mean everybody was Christian overnight. It just means that Christianity was accepted and preferred, and people were given sort of an instant baptism or welcoming into the faith. But Constantine uh, created a city that was a Christian city, one of the first, and a Christian empire, and they did real well. Uh, Rome, on the other hand, wasn't doing as well, and they were weakened because they were hiring mercenaries because the birth rate went down. Roman citizens were more interested in partying than having kids and raising soldiers. So they began to use mercenaries. Eventually the mercenaries turned on them and you had a Gothic invasion. Uh, now on the next slide, slide 10, you notice it says Christianity comes to Rome. And this is where we begin to get our interest around 452 guy named Attila the Hun led his army through the north and finally into Italy to take Rome. Uh, he was a barbarian, and there's a lot of myth and legend and history and uh, not so sure about history floating around, but Attila was uh, one of the, what they call the scourge of Rome, the scourge of God. Uh, he was killing people in the north. He wiped out several legions, and when he came into northern Italy, his goal was to destroy Rome. And the Roman guard in Rome was just, I think it's like six cohorts. It wasn't enough really to fight his army. And so you see these characters. Valentinian III was the emperor. There was a guy there who was head of the Christian church, and they called him uh, Bishop Leo I. He later had got the title of Pope Leo I. And a guy named Council of Venius, who was the prefect of Rome, sort of like the mayor. They got together and they said, we're going to go appeal to Attila and see if we can bribe him, if nothing else, to leave us alone. Uh, they met Attila near the area of Mantua uh, and trying to convince him. Well, Valentinian didn't go. Avinius didn't want to meet him, so Leo goes to meet him. Uh, and so it's Leo and Avinius are the ones that are there. Uh, Later, the legends say that St. Peter and St. Paul showed up and helped him, but that's more of a, a legend. But what happened is they did meet. Now, nobody's quite sure what happened in the meeting. Uh, Pope and Attila went aside from their armies or from the people with them, and they, they talked. And when they finished, Attila got up and left and turned his army around and went back to the north. Uh, Leo goes to Rome where he is given... Uh, a hero's welcome. And this is where Christianity comes to Rome because basically they said, well, none of our Rome's, none of the Roman gods seem to work. So they wanted to give credit to the Christian God. And I'm sort of paraphrasing history and summing up, but in, in essence, what they did was they said, what does God expect of us? And Leo, of course, you give him the opportunity. He said, well, he wants you to get rid of these gods. He wants to change your ways. Uh, and that changed everything. It's like, stop the pagan music, stop the bacchanals and the dances and the drinking and all this stuff and become Christians and learn to walk in the way of God. 
Well, of course, not everybody did, but the Romans saw the success that Byzantium was having or Constantinople was having as a Christian empire. And so they had seen the power of God turn away Attila. And so it was an easy convincing them to uh, accept God and become a Christian empire. And so Rome was allowed to, or Romans allowed Christianity to be the primary religion. Now they had other religions, but eventually they, they forced them all out. Um, that, that saved Rome, and it was the beginning of the influence. Now, look at the time frame. It's around 452, uh, and this is also the time when Rome starts to, to digress. The Goths had come in, led by a guy named Alric, and they had sacked Rome for three days. Attila had come in. So Rome showed themselves basically to be an easy touch. But by now... Most of the problem was in all these tribes fighting one another. And what you have is Roman legions stationed all along Roman highways, and the army is getting weak. The mercenaries call themselves Romans. They have Roman equipment. And what you have is these groups of men who have horses and weapons begin to rule over the areas. Instead of being there on Rome's orders to protect them, they become the protectorate and the lords, and they make themselves nobles. Uh, this is, and like I say, I am sort of rushing and paraphrasing, but this is the development of what's known as the feudal system. Now, on slide 11, you'll see some historical highlights. You see the collapse of Rome around 450, and you see, notice the names, medieval age, dark ages, time of migration, age of faith, age of chivalry. All that occurs in this next thousand years period. Uh, but number two says three classes of people, nobles, peasants, and clergy. Uh, number three tells you that's the feudal system. And what we have here, the feudal system, you know, the word feud is, you know, you sort of against. Well, here's three groups that are working together but against one another. The nobles control the peasants. The peasants serve the nobles and protect them. Uh, the church controls both groups and make sure that the peasants don't rebel and the nobles do not treat the peasants poorly. Basically, if you wanted to say, they'd say, look, you peasants, you grow enough grain to feed the nobles, they'll protect you. You nobles, you let them feed you and don't take advantage of them and they won't rebel. Uh, so basically you can tax them, you get rich, you don't have to fight. Uh, and the only thing you have to worry about is some other lord in a nearby city or, or region come in and try to take your stuff. And that did happen, but you had a, a system. Now, the problem of the feudal system is it's sort of static. It doesn't really encourage progress. But the church now is able to go in and take a, a leadership role, controlling role. Uh, they're not nobles, but they're not peasants. They ask the nobles, hey, you build a castle? How about building a church or build us a place where we can study? And in this time, you have monasteries being built. Later on around the 12th century, you begin building of giant cathedrals and churches. And all this is to keep people sort of under control, you might say. Uh, what it does, though, it allows for the development of certain things. And you'll notice I, I mentioned three things there. First is education. The church becomes the center of education. Now, the nobles get educated and the priests get educated. The peasants, they don't need an education. But architecture, all the Roman engineering skill, uh, the church took over because the Romans were great engineers in their buildings and all sorts of things. And so the church takes over and they pretty much control what's built and how it's built. And they teach people. And you have the, the beginning of the apprentice system where a, a priest will know something and he gets some people to teach it. Stone cutting is a big deal, and, you know, all things like that. And finally, art and music. Art was very one per, one perspective. It was not considered an attempt to create a reality on canvas. It was just a way of conveying, you know, what's going on. And music was controlled by the church. And in controlling it, they pretty much did away with all popular music or secular music. The church said music is to worship by. And, you know, if you're out singing a work song in the field and the priest comes by, he may say, be quiet, and you have to be quiet. Uh, that it was sort of a dry period, you might say, but it lasted a long time. 
people all the time they heard music was in church they go to church the priest would sing usually in a language that the people didn't understand latin was the accepted language and a lot of people didn't understand latin uh, then as you move on through number five it talks about the crusades that's going to happen on up around the 10th through the 14th century and then you have the hundred years war in the 13th and 14th century between france and england that's going to take a lot of a big dent into activity as you got two Christian kingdoms fighting each other, each side saying God is on our side. Uh, and that's where you get the you know, burning of Joan of Arc and stuff. And then finally, number seven, the big blow was the bubonic plague or the Black Death. Uh, and roughly around a third of the people in Europe died from that. Uh, the church steps in and the monks and the people that are in the monasteries, they, they have cleanliness rituals, they're sequestered from people. And so religious people weren't dying as frequently. And so people get to say, well, God's protecting his own. And that drew people back to the church. The other odd thing about it was people who had children and didn't want to see their children die would give them to the church to be raised in, in a covenant convent with nuns or to be put in a monastery and became young priest. Uh, musically, there's an interesting part of that. And that is that... Uh, the, they wanted the priests to sing, but they didn't want women singing. So women couldn't sing at first, but they needed somebody to sing the high part. So they'd take these children who had female voices until they reached puberty. And so all these young boys sang the soprano part. So you had uh, a good bass part with men and a sort of baritone part with men. And you had these young boys sing the soprano. And music began to develop from single line music to multiple line music to even music with accompaniment. The tragic part of that was that as the boys grew up, pretty soon they had too many, and so they needed younger men. And so a lot of people, knowing that they wanted kids that could sing the high part, would castrate their children so that their voice would never change. And that way the church had a soprano for the rest of their life. Sounds brutal. It is brutal. Uh, but it was a way to save your child from the plague. Now, all of that's happening in the meantime, this helps to develop uh, the use of music, art, education, all these things in, in this period. Now, uh, I mentioned, I put a slide in here about the Crusades, slide 12, just so you know about the Crusades. I know you know probably a lot of them, but you, you probably have uh, an odd version because the Crusades are basically, you can blame the church for that. Uh, 1071, the uh, Turks captured Jerusalem. And you see in 1095, Pope Urban II, uh, he goes to a field in France and he gives this impassioned speech. And he said, the savage, the infidels, the, they call them Saracens, actually, they're trampling the holy places. And the church was beginning to lose a lot of power because the people were getting more mature and less, you know, not attending church as much. Uh, and so... He does something that some people say, well, that's brilliant, but it's actually a little bit on the mean side. He told the people that if they would take the cross, whether Lord, noble, or peasant, take the cross and go on a crusade, they, you would never lose a battle, you wouldn't die, and your sins would be forgiven. Now, that's a great deal. First of all, if you never lose a battle, hey, that's good. If you don't ever die, that's better. And if your sins are forgiven simply for going and killing the Saracens, that's even greater. So to take the cross, to let you know, that meant that crusaders would take a cross and they would put it on their shoulder right here, diagonally toward their heart. Uh, I know you've seen the Templars with the big red cross on their chest, but the crusaders wore it here, almost like a badge. And they said, take the cross, put it over your heart and go to battle. And so you had five of these crusades. I've, I've listed more. Uh, I listed the six, but some of them, you know, you can read them. Uh, they were never fully successful. Uh, and something that really bothers me is historians, for some reason, they, they point and they say, uh, the crusaders were bloodthirsty and evil and they caused all the problems and the church was evil. They, they never point out the fact that prior to this and after this, Islam, the Muslims, led crusades against the church and Europe. Now, 
you may not know this. Here's your trivia thing. But we're looking at six crusades. Uh, some of them didn't even get to Jerusalem. There was some hard stories. How many times did Islam invade Europe on various crusades? They came up through, through Spain. They came across into Austria. They got as far as Vienna and as far north almost as Paris. Do you know how many crusades there were from Islam? Try 1,100. Not 11. 1,100. That's 1,100 times a, a Muslim army invaded Europe, killing, pillaging, raping, and occupying. They occupied uh, Spain until around the 14th century, and then they weren't totally run out of there. Uh, they occupied Eastern Europe for a long time. And even today, some of your Eastern European countries and uh, areas of Bosnia, Herzegovina, and those uh, Armenia and those north parts of Greece are still Muslim countries. Uh, Romania, big Muslim population. Uh, you go in the USSR, you have Georgia, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan. Those are Muslim places that the Muslims came in. Uh, so just to be fair, we need to to realize that it wasn't just the Christian religion that was going on crusade. Comparatively, we hardly went at all. Uh, there was other religions that were trying to take over. But that's just a little history to let you know that with the coming of the crusades, the reason I point this out, you get a cross culture. And from the crusades, you get uh, things like the music and the instruments of the Middle East makes its way back. The gypsies who lived in Eastern Europe followed crusaders into Western Europe. Uh, you have a change in music, you have a change in form, you have more poetry. Uh, the troubadours and trouvères, the, the wandering minstrels, you might say, most of those were crusaders coming home who had enough of fighting. They had gypsies following them and they would go and they'd arrive at these castles and courts and they were welcome because they were nobles and they would put on a show. They would sing songs. And music begins to change from just religious music to secular music, thanks to the Crusades. Now, uh, some of the characteristics, I'll go to slide 13. Uh, these are characteristics of the early church music. So I just took you all the way into the latter part where secular music comes in. Now I'm taking you back to the early church. Most of it was chant. Uh, only composers and musicians were allowed were priests. The male voice was dominant. Women couldn't even sing in public. And vo vocal music with no instruments was the main form of expression. That starts around the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and all the way around to the 8th century. 9th and 10th century, it starts to change a little bit. Women are allowed to sing. Harmony develops. And they develop instruments that are acceptable. But it was very slow in coming. Uh, and remember, the main purpose of music was for worship. And they sang songs that were not very melodic. They were mostly just reciting scripture. Um, slide 14, as music develops, they begin to write music. And this is one of the early, what's known as illuminated texts. I just put this so you can see. It's very beautiful. All this is hand done as monks would get together and they would copy the Bible. Usually 30 of them sitting around one copy, looking it up, copying it and spreading it around. And they would copy music and sending around. Um, the, oh, here's another one on slide 15 and 16. Another example of the writing, uh, the illuminated text, the music, how it's written. And then, let's see, slide 17, 18. Our slide 17 is another one. And then we come to slide 18. And there's, there's a slide here about sacred music. Uh, a lot of this is sort of repeating what I've already said, but you get a couple of new names, primarily a guy named Gregory, who was the Pope around uh, 590 to 604. Gregory gets credit for being the first Pope to want to standardize how music is written because he would go to one town, he'd hear an hallelujah, go to another town, hear hallelujah, it sounds totally different. And he said, well, we need to get the titles right. We need to write this so that we can sing these good songs everywhere and get rid of bad songs. And so he came up with a form uh, called Neumes. We talked about that last week in notation. Uh, and Gregory gets credit for that. So much credit that everything the church wrote all, all the way up to almost the 13th century was called Gregorian chant, even though he didn't write it. But the people who wrote it weren't taking credit. They were giving credit to Pope Gregory. 
And so Gregorian chant became to, uh, it, it, it became the church music. And it also began, began to uh, change a little bit as they added lines with certain harmonies. Uh, on slide 19, you see the characteristics of chant. And there's a couple of terms here I want you to know. Modal, it's a, it's a scale. We use scales today such as major, minor. The Greeks used modes, which were usually six note scales, and they had five or six of them. We've taken a couple of those and expanded them into our major and minor tonality. So we don't know what music sounded like before chant, but knowing what modes were brought in and used, we sort of get an idea of what music sounded like before the church in Greece. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but you know, there's no recording, no written music that we can understand prior to the sixth century. Uh, the best we can do is look at what the music sounded like in the church and realize they use Greek modes and we get sort of an idea of maybe what music sounded like prior to that. Uh, monophonic music, single melody. Acapella, which we say means no accompaniment. Acapella actually literally means for the chapel where there was no instruments, but it's come to be known as without instruments. And then liturgical was a term because the liturgy is not just church music, it's service music, and it has a certain order that they follow. That order of the worship is called the liturgy. And so when you have music that is liturgical, that is music for the service and used at certain points for praise and for prayer and that sort of thing. <clears throat> The next slide, slide 20, talks about Gregorian chant, uh, and i give you a little bit of what I've already said. I, there's redundant here, but I think it's good for you to do it. The two styles of chant that I want you to, to try to remember is monosyllabic chant and melismatic chant. Monosyllabic basically was a chant where you have one syllable of a word, and it gets one note. So if you sang Alleluia, it'd be Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Melismatic chant is several notes per syllable. And that came later as they began to add more mel mel like a melody. So that same Alleluia instead of being Alleluia could be Alleluia. It sounds better. People liked it. Uh, but those are the two things. And that's, that's a major development. Next, uh, we talked some more about the feudal system. I, I don't know why I left that slide in there, but I did. But we've already talked about that some. Uh, the next slide talks about uh, later developments. Now, this is the Middle Ages, but we sort of bleed into the Renaissance a little bit. Not completely, but we're headed that direction. But you see terms and highlighted like monophonic, polyphony, and then a couple of names. Uh, at Notre Dame in Paris, there was a guy named Leonin and Peretz, and they was, uh, worked together, and they began to write polyphony, which is multi-lines, multi-voices. And the next name down, you see it down there, is Guillaume de Machaut. He takes that idea. He was also at Paris. And Guillaume de Machaut took the idea of polyphony, borrowing from Leonin and Peretz, and he says, well, let's make a worship service full of to follow the liturgy and do it all in music. And he called it the Mass. And that was a major development, not only for the church worship and for people to understand what they're doing, but also for music. Because now everybody could learn to sing. Uh, the language was still Latin, but more and more they began to open it up to where later on they'll be able to sing in their own language and they can sing a Mass in their language, which people, I mean, think about going to church and you didn't understand a word the preacher was saying or what the choir was singing. You know, you're just supposed to sit there and listen. And basically, your church experience would be sitting there meditating on noise that you don't understand. But here, through help uh, through Guillaume de Machaut creating the Mass, they could follow. And they knew that, oh, we're going to start off with uh, some praise to God, and then we're going to ask God for stuff, and then we're going to sanctify ourselves, then we're going to have a little message about Jesus saving our sins, then we'll have a, an end of it. And later on, they added the benediction. It has parts of it. It made sense so that people could follow. 
Uh, from there, we go into secular music, uh, slide 24. And secular is just another word for popular music. And I explain again what I've already told you, the troubadours and the troubadours, uh, same thing, just different language. And then you had the people traveling with them. The word is jongleurs. And most historians think that these jongleurs were actually gypsies who were camp followers of the crusaders. And when they came back, they just kept following them. As they were going home, they just kept following them all the way from Eastern Europe into Western Europe. The jongleurs were a very low-class people, probably acrobats, jugglers, and with them came their women who were palm readers and dancers and maybe some kind of, I don't know, prostitution may have been involved. Uh, at one point, one priest said that the army needed to kill all the camp followers. That's why God wasn't letting them win battles. Uh, but that was in the Crusades. Also on this, you will see uh, something really new, and that was the estampi. That's number three. The estampi is a term used for two things. It's actually the name of a song, but it's also the name of a form of song, and that form is dance music. And this is something totally new because, you know, you know that dancing goes on. You know that dancing used to go on, then they stopped. In the Middle East, you had all kinds of dancing. The priests were not letting people dance, but now the these noble troubadours and troubadours come along, and it's like they're saying, look, we fought your battle, you lied, we died. Uh, you know, and there was a sort of a rebellion against the church. And with that came new music, secular music, popular music, you might say, and dancing. And people liked it. And so the church had to sort of give way a little bit because you know they, they couldn't force the people now like they used to because people were a little more, I guess you'd say, advanced. Um, Anyway, the next slide, slide 25, talks more about secular music. And slide 25, 26, uh, I give you a picture of two of the minstrels and the jongleurs uh, are the troubadours. I want you to notice these guys. The paintings give you a tip off that these are, these are not just singers. These are warriors, but they were warriors who were going anti-war. I mean, look how that one guy's dressed with feathers in his hair. Uh, but then you look at his body, it's very muscular. And so these guys were warriors who had put away their sword and picked up their guitars or the lute in this case. And uh, they were a whole new class of people. Like I said, most of them were either knights or they were some type of lord. From there, we move on to the 14th century. And, I, and this is where I, I just touch on this a little bit because in the 14th century, there was a period called the Ars Nova. You have the Middle Ages, and then you have the Renaissance, and right in between them, there's a brief period called the Ars Nova, and I, I like to tell people that the Ars Nova was the bridge from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, because of the Renaissance, uh, everything was wide open. The restrictions by the church were set aside, and, and people were really doing some exciting things in the Renaissance. A lot of historians believe that the Renaissance may have been the greatest age of man's development, for, at least for Western civilization. But what you see is uh, some characteristics of the Ars Nova. The end of the Middle Ages has a weaker church and a weaker feudal system, uh, new freedoms. People uh, had the freedom to compose, to write, to perform more instruments. Uh, they had a new system of notation, which is very similar to what we use. Uh, they began to do things with rhythm, such as syncopation, to give it a beat or an altered beat, and the church no longer had a monopoly. The French and Italian styles call this the Ars Nova, and you think, well, French and Italian, we've been talking about Rome, but now France, uh, Italy, parts of Germany, Britain, and northern Spain, they have become more sophisticated. What used to be called the land of the barbarians was now the cultural centers, particularly in Paris which became a cultural center. And around Avignon, the Pope moved there. Eventually, he had a Pope in France. Uh, I apologize. Somebody just tried to call me on my phone. I forgot to put the Do Not Disturb sign. Uh, after that, you will see the talk a little bit more about the Mass as I show you the parts of the Mass. This fully developed in the Renaissance, too. And then there's a page, uh, slide number three, 29. These are the terms that I want you to look at and study because I'm going to give you a test on these terms. 
I, I've got some questions over there, but I don't think I'm going to use those. So you'll see the test and you can see what's in there and what's not. But make note of these terms because the test will be on that. Some of them will be matching, some fill in the blank. The last part of this slide presentation is instruments. I'm just showing you pictures of them. If you want to, you can go online, look it up, and you'll see how these instruments sound as people play them. If you've ever been to a Renaissance Festival, a Renaissance Fair, you'll see these instruments. You'll see people dressing like that. Now, that is the lecture for this Middle Ages PowerPoint. And what I'm, what I'm telling you sort of goes along with it. So, Watch the PowerPoint as you listen to this lecture. And then after that, uh, look at the test and work on the test and send that to me. And that will be lesson six. And I'm gonna to try to get lesson seven posted because we'll do lesson six uh, and lesson seven next week. And I may not, there may not be a lesson eight because if, if we can do those two, you've got a good start on the history of music, which is, this is introduction to music as introduction we don't necessarily have to cover all the way up to modern day because you know most modern music. So if I get through the Renaissance, I feel like I've done what the course requires to introducing the music. Now, I will tell you that in the Baroque, Classical, and Romantic period, there's a lot of music written, but I'll just about bet you that you're more familiar with it, with it than you are with this, but this is the foundation. So remember to get me your listening assignments, the research paper I would like next, I think it's, Tuesday or Wednesday the 6th, whenever that is, uh, and I'd like this lesson, and I'll get try to get Lesson 7 posted right away so you can get those two done. Uh, for those in Fall 1, we're ending. Now, those in the dual enrollment program, uh, don't get too worried because we're going to continue. We're going to look at these other periods, uh, so you'll get the whole can of worms, so to speak, uh, but I would like for you, oh, I should clarify, the Fall one, I want your papers next week. The dual enrollment classes, you don't have to turn yours in until December, uh, early December. So uh, I may have confused everybody on that one. I, I was talking to two different groups. Fall one will be over in October, second week. Uh, the DHS or dual enrollment program will continue on to December. So fall one, let's get all the work in next week. Uh, no later than the following week. And dual enrollment programs from Chester and uh, Great Falls and Louisville and some from Buford, you've got until December. And we're going to continue down this path of historical periods. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, I'm, I may try to put a couple of samples of music in there for you to listen to because I think it's good to listen. Uh, I've got to make sure I can get all this posted. I'm going to try to do that right away so you can have it. Um, hopefully tomorrow, which is Thursday, I think. Anyway, um, I apologize for getting this in late because my computer crashed and I'm sort of having to transfer data that I can find off of hard drives onto this. And I think I've got enough to get through this lesson and hopefully tomorrow I'll get my computer back and be back on track. Again, I apologize for any inconvenience, but Thank you for the work you're sending, uh, and I'll try to get all this graded and posted on Blackboard. And this information is going on Blackboard, hopefully, in a few minutes. I'll, well, I won't see you, but I'll talk to you later. Thank you.